God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. I believe a person comes into a right relationship with God by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I believe the Bible is the Word of God and has the right to command my belief in action. I believe I am significant because of my position as a child of God. Hello, church. It is so great to see you, whether you're here in the North Sanctuary, the South Sanctuary, you're part of our Speedway campus. So excited to have Westside Leavenworth, Colonial Presbyterian Church, Harvest Ridge Church joining us on this journey, as well as the folks from Cordillera Ranch in San Antonio, Texas. And of course, we love always the people that are online, including a guy named Mitch Nutterfield, who's joining us today from Trinidad, Colorado. Let's let Mitch know that we're excited he's here. Let's give it up for Mitch. Way to go, Mitch. We're so excited that you have joined us. Okay, the first order of business uh, is I need to check and make sure that uh, those of you who are here, uh, and I can see you guys online, if you brought your Believe book or a Bible, raise it up high over your head, because you're gonna need these. Uh huh. All righty. I've taken note. I've got this spiritual gift of knowing who's done it and who's not. You're going to need this. If you're brand new, uh, ask the person next to you, what is this thing that he's talking about? It's a pretty cool journey that we are on. As a matter of fact, behind me, there are 10 doors, and each door symbolically represents access to the life God intended for you to live. But in order to get access to it, you have to unlock the door. And so what we are seeking to do is to give you the key to unlock each door, to give you access to the life God intended for you to live. Each key is a key belief found in scripture. Door one, the key, can only be opened if you know the answer to the first key question. Who is God? If you know it, say it with me. I believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How about the key scripture? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Man, that's awesome. That's door one. Behind door two is an amazing life. And in order to get access to it, you have to have the key that unlocks this question. Does God care about me? If you know the answer, shout it out with me. I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. How about this scripture? Say it with me. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? That is so exciting. Some of you who are maybe guests online or here in the room are thinking to yourself, I'm familiar with preachers who quote scriptures, but I'm not familiar with an entire church body that is all on one page declaring what they believe and why it matters. Well, guess what? Welcome to Westside Family Church because we are a group of people, right? Let's give it up, come on. We're a group of people that are on a journey to finally be able to declare, I know what I believe and why it matters. So today we come to door number three. Are you ready to find out what's behind door number three? Are you ready to find out what's behind door number three? Come on, I'm preaching better than you're responding. Let's pray, then we'll get to work. God. Thank you so much for your word that gives us the access to these key ideas, these key beliefs, that if we embed them in our heart, it will change our lives forever. Everybody hearing my words wants new life. And so, Father, we enter into this not only with our mind, but our heart and our intent to follow you. Please shower your grace upon us in the name of Jesus. And everyone shouted, amen. amen. After a long illness, a woman died and arrived at the gates of heaven. When she got to the gate, uh, she was waiting for St. Peter to greet her, and as she's waiting, she peers through the gate 
and she sees a wonderful banquet table. And sitting at the banquet table are her parents and friends and family that have gone on before her. And they start shouting out, hello, hello, it's good to see you. We've been waiting for you. Finally, St. Peter comes up and she says, wow, this really is a wonderful place after all. What must I do to get in? And St. Peter said, well, you need to spell a word. And she said, okay, what's the word? He said, the word is love. And so she spells out L-O-V-E. And St. Peter says, that's correct. And he welcomes her into heaven. Well, fast forward three years, St. Peter comes to this lady and says, I need you to sort of guard the gate for me today. And she gladly accepts the, uh, the invite. And sure enough, on this day, wouldn't you know it, her husband arrives. And she says, wow, I'm surprised to see you. <laughs> she says, how have you been? And he says, well, I've been, I've been fine doing pretty well since you died. She says, I ended up marrying the young, beautiful nurse that took care of you when you were sick. I, I then I won the lottery and I sold that little house that you were in. We bought a big mansion. We've been traveling all over the world. As a matter of fact, today I was out water skiing and the, I fell and the ski hit me in the head and I died and now I'm standing before you. And he says, this is really a really wonderful place. What do I have to do to get in? And she says, well, you have to spell a word. And uh, he said, well, what word? She said, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> I love St. Peter at the pearly gates jokes. Most of them are pretty funny and all of them are completely off base theologically. <laughs> but this particular story invites a very important question. And that question is how do I get in? Or as we have posed our key question today, if you're taking notes, how do I have a relationship with God? How do I have a relationship with God? You'll want to know that it has nothing to do with your ability to spell. And everyone shouted, amen, amen for that. But it does, lean in, lean in, it does have everything to do with having the right blood type. Huh, maybe you never thought of that before. Everything to do with having the right blood type. Let me take you back to the beginning and begin laying out my argument. In Genesis chapter 3, at the very beginning, uh, where we lost our relationship with God, something very significant happened. This is when we lost, humanity lost our relationship with God. God gives us the freedom of choice and he certainly gave Adam and Eve the freedom to choose. Now I know you know the story, but you're paying me to tell it, so listen in, ready? God lays two trees in the garden. The first is called the tree of life. The second is called the tree, if you know it with me, say it, uh, the knowledge of good and evil. Strange name for a tree, but God is going to use these two trees amidst all the other trees to give Adam and Eve the freedom to choose whether or not they were buying in to this relationship with God in the garden. God said you can eat of all the trees and the tree of life. As a matter of fact, this tree will sustain your life forever. But the only tree of all the trees that you can eat of is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of that tree, you will signal to me your will to not embrace our relationship and our relationship will in fact be broken. Now I'm gonna read this out of the Believe book on page 47 or Genesis chapter three. And I want you to take note of the very first thing that Adam and Eve do after they eat of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's down about three quarters of the way in bold type. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So she sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for them. It's interesting, at the moment that Adam and Eve take of this fruit, they cover themselves with 
fig leaves. Why? Because they felt vulnerable. The tree is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That means from this moment on, uh, the thoughts that Adam and Eve have toward the world and toward the people around them are no longer just good thoughts like it was before they ate, but now they have a combination. They have good thoughts and evil thoughts about the people that are in their lives. And so Eve is standing there upon eating of this forbidden fruit, and she says, I have good thoughts about my husband Adam, but huh, I also have evil thoughts about my husband Adam. And if I have new evil thoughts about Adam, certainly he might have evil thoughts toward me. And they felt vulnerable. They felt unprotected. This is the way of humanity. And they felt a need to cover themselves of their nakedness, lest someone take advantage of them. Now, the question is, uh, what does God do? Later on in the day, God catches up with them. And if you'll turn to page 49 or still in Genesis chapter 3, when he comes upon Adam and Eve after they've eaten of the fruit and covered themselves with the fig leaves, this is what it says on the top of page 49. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So one of the first things, interestingly, that God does is that he replaces their fig leaves with animal skins. The question is, why does he do that? Why does he do that? Well, certainly the obvious answer is that animal skin is much more durable than greenery. Okay, that's the obvious answer. But there is a deeper clue that God is laying out on the very first pages of the Bible at the moment we lost our relationship with him. If you're taking notes, write this down. To cover our sin, it will require the shedding of another's blood. To cover our sin, it's going to require the shedding of another's blood. Clue is given to us at the moment our relationship with God is separated. Now, I want you to fast forward in the Old Testament to the children of Israel. At this season of the story, they're called Hebrews because they have lost their identity because they are now in slavery in a foreign land called Egypt. And they've been in this situation for some time. God hears their cries and raises up Moses to come and deliver the children of Israel. So Moses rolls into town and he confronts the mighty Pharaoh by saying to him, say it with me, let my people go. And one of the ways in which Moses is going to convince the mighty Pharaoh who thinks of himself as a God that he should let his free labor force go is he unveils the 10 mighty plagues. I just want to focus on the last plague, plague number 10. God tells Moses to tell the people that he's going to now bring judgment on Egypt for what they have done to Israel, including, if you remember the story, including the day that Pharaoh issued an edict to kill uh, every uh, uh, born male. So on a particular day, on a particular day at midnight, the angel of death is going to go through every house and every stable and is going to strike down the firstborn male in every single house and stable. But God is going to provide a way of deliverance for the children of Israel. If you have your believe book, turn to page 51. Or if you have your Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 12. And about halfway down in bold type, you're going to hear the instructions that were given. Then Moses summoned all of the elders of Israel and said to them, go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it into the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land, 
to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. So midnight comes on this particular day, just as God has promised. All of the firstborn males in Egypt are struck down, are killed. The firstborn of the prisoner, the firstborn of the livestock, and even the firstborn of the mighty house of Pharaoh. The only ones who were spared, those who had the blood of the Passover lamb on the door frames of their houses. But if the destroyer, the angel of death, did not see the blood on the door frame of a house, then they would enter in. But it, listen to this, it could not be any blood. It had to be the blood of a lamb without blemish or defect. That's important. If you're taking notes, write this down. To have death pass over your home, you need the blood of the lamb covered over the door frame of your house. Let me read that again. To have death pass over your home, you need the blood of the lamb covered over the door frame of your house. The Jewish people were instructed to celebrate this particular day uh, forever on Nisan the 15th, according to the Jewish calendar, and even to this day, Jewish people, as well as Messianic Jews or Christian Jews, celebrate this day faithfully on this day, and it is simply called Passover. Way to go. Now, I wanna fast forward now to the New Testament. We're now 1,400 years later, and we've come to the final days of the life of Christ. I want you to listen carefully to what Jesus tells his disciples on page 54 uh, of your Believe book, or Matthew chapter 26 in verse one, about a little over halfway down. Jesus said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Jesus is going to be crucified at the same time as the Passover, which on the Gregorian calendar, which we follow, falls sometimes uh, be somewhere between March and April, and it also represents the most significant celebration amongst Christians. 2.2 billion Christians around the world celebrate at the same time of Passover, this celebration, which we call Easter. Passover and Easter come together at the same time for a very important reason. Do you see what's going on here? God has wired this story from the very beginning. At the moment we broke relationship with God, he has been laying the clue down to cover our sins. It's going to take the spilling of another's blood. Then he gives us the Passover and the way in which the children of Israel are saved is the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb, is put over the door frames of their houses and they are spared. And now Jesus Christ, all these many years later, is being crucified at Passover. He's being crucified. The blood of Jesus is being poured out of his back and his chest where they beat him. Blood is pouring out from his head where they stuck the crown of thorns in his head and blood is pouring from his side from the sword that the Roman soldier stuck in him. But the blood, listen carefully, the blood that came out of Jesus is not the same as ours. The blood that came out of Jesus is not the ordinary blood from the lineage of Adam. Our blood is contaminated with sin. At the moment that Adam and Eve rejected God's vision, their nature was changed. Their blood was changed. Sin runs through their veins. And everyone who is in the lineage of Adam, including all of us, 
we have this contamination in our blood. The blood that Jesus shed that day is a different blood type. It is a blood from a lamb who is spotless and blameless. Listen to what John says in John chapter one and verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus all along has been the lamb refer to in the Old Testament. Listen to what Paul later wrote. He obviously got the connection. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. This is what I wanted you to see. For Christ, read it out loud with me, our Passover lamb has been cru crucified, sacrificed. The Passover lamb. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Now I want you to listen to what the apostle Peter said later in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Listen closely. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious, say it with me, the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Peter says no amount of money will be able to get you out of the predicament handed down to you by Adam, our ancestor. It will only be through the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. It means that his blood is without contamination. There are no contaminants like ours. Remember, God covered Adam and Eve with the skin of an animal. He was signaling to us, it's going to take the blood of another to cover our sins. Going deeper, it's going to take a different blood type, a blood that is not contaminated with sin. So here's the key question. How do I have a relationship with God? If you're taking notes, write this down. For death to pass over you and have an eternal relationship with God, you must have the blood of Christ covered over the door frame of your life. If you want to have death pass over you, just like in Egypt for the Israelites, you're going to have to have the blood of the blameless lamb without defect, without sin contaminant, over the door frame of your life. If it is there, then death, when it visits you, will pass over you. The first one to apply the blood of Christ to their life is the thief on the cross. You may remember that the other thief is hurling insults at Jesus, but this thief, in his final hour, turns to the other thief and says, in Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 40. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today, you will be with me in paradise. The thief got it. His blood was filled with sin. The only solution, apply the sinless blood of Jesus to his life through belief in Jesus. And guess what? It worked. <clears throat> Folks, this is how Love wins.
life began like any other man held beneath a mother's loving gaze and somewhere between now and then I lost the man I could have been took everything that wasn't mine to take but love believes that it is not too late only one of us deserves this cross a suffering that should belong to me and deep within this man I hang beside is the place where shame and grace collide and it's beautiful agony that he believes it's not too late for me this is how love will Every single time And climbing high up on a tree Where someone else should die This is how love heals The deepest part of you Letting himself bleed into The middle of your wounds This is what love says Standing at the door Death can speak again This is how love wins Did you see This moment from the start That we would drink This cup of suffering wonder did we ever meet childhood games and dusty streets for all my many sorrows and regrets nothing could compare to just this one to him the presence of my king cannot fall upon my knees I cannot carry you up to your throne you instead will carry me back home this is how love wins every single time climbing high up on a tree where someone else should this is how love heals the deepest part of you, letting himself bleed into the middle of your wounds. This is what love says, standing at the door. You don't have to be who you've been before, silenced by his voice. Death can't speak again This is how love wins What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. Cause this is what love says, standing at the door. You don't have to be who you've been before. Silenced by his voice. 
death can't speak again this is how love wins This is how love wins, every single time. If you would like death to pass over you, if you would like a relationship with God, if you would like to live eternally in his presence, you need to realize it has nothing to do with your ability to spell. It has not anything to do with your good works are simply being slightly better than the person next to you. It has nothing to do with the amount of money you give to the poor. It has everything to do with the blood type. So I ask you the question, have you applied the blood of the Passover lamb to the doorframe of your life? I'm not saying, do you understand it? I'm asking if you have embraced it for yourself. I'm not asking if your grandmother prays for you. I'm not asking if you go to church. I'm asking you, have you made the visceral decision that said, oh my God, I have offended God. I have sin coming through the veins of my very body. And if I die in this condition, I will die eternally separated from God. And have you come to terms with that and that God provided the solution? He left the heavenlies as God took on flesh. And flowing through his veins is not a contaminated blood like ours given to us by our ancestor Adam, lived out by our own choices, but rather it is sinless and without defect. And when it poured out, it became a sufficient sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. When death comes to your door, I speak to you the truth. If the blood of the lamb has not been applied by your decision, the door frame of your life, God will honor your decision and you will experience death and eternal separation from God. However, if through simple faith and confession and belief, like the thief on the cross, you apply the blood to the door frames of your life. When death comes at your door, death will pass over you. Yes, the body of Adam can't make it into eternity, but the real you, the spirit will, and one day you'll receive a resurrected body just like Jesus to live forever and ever. So how does one do this? It involves a confession of your sin, the acknowledgement that you're in need of a lamb. Number two, the belief that Jesus is the lamb of God, the son of God, and that his blood is without sin. And then it involves you accepting that for your own life, not just understanding it, but believing it in your heart. And one of the primary ways that a, that a person signifies this belief before man and before God is to be baptized. Baptized, baptism is a symbol of dying to the old Adam and being born to the second Adam. It is a declaration of your heart. So I ask you the question, not do you understand it, but have you applied the blood of Jesus to the doorframe of your life? I tell you the truth, you never know when death is going to knock on your door. Last week, We had a lady, I was not here, who had a pretty serious seizure. Maybe you weren't in the service where she, and it scared her, and it was pretty serious. She decided this morning to get baptized. Way to go. (laughs) 
And the same is true for you. So we're gonna give you the opportunity. We've already celebrated a number of people who chose to be baptized. And Pastor Jim is right there and he's ready to receive you as well. He said, I didn't come prepared. No, no, this is how you get prepared. We have clothes for you. We'll take care of it. We'll receive your confession to accept Christ and we'll baptize you. Maybe you've already done that in your heart, but you've never gone public for Jesus. He asked you to do this and I cannot, if you believe what I have spoken to you today from the word, I cannot believe that you would walk out of here not acting upon this amazing truth. Folks, this is how love wins every single time. Thank you for joining us for this message from Westside Family Church. We're on a journey of discovering how to think, act, and be more like Jesus. If you've been impacted by what God is doing through the Believe journey, we'd love to hear from you. Share your story at westsidefamily.church forward slash we believe. These stories are incredibly encouraging to both our staff and our church family. If you'd like to invest in what God is doing through Westside, you can give online at westsidefamily.church forward slash give. Thank you so much for watching.